So moving our journey through chapter six, uh, we're gonna start with a review of some uh, issues on how to classify and determine inventory and learning objective one. Much of it, like I said, you've learned in chapter uh, five. So a lot of it's going to be um, a review for you. And most of what we're gonna be doing um, is understanding those, what we call inventory cost flow methods. How do businesses determine their cost of goods sold? And, um, and that's gonna be the more interesting part. Okay, so we're gonna be doing that today. But first off, uh, just a review of some things that we've talked about from chapter five about inventory. Uh, the focus was on merchandising. And of course, there's only one uh, account that's uh, asset account that merchandisers use. And that's basically their merchandise inventory account or inventory in many cases, it's just simplified. But what you're gonna be seeing in the next uh, class <clears throat> when we look at managerial accounting uh, and dive deeper into manufacturing, for example, their inventory actually has three different types of classifications. So you're gonna be learning this in Accounting 204. So I will not kind of bother you with that right now, uh, but just tell you what's coming. You've already know, uh, you've already been introduced to the two types of inventory systems that are used. Overwhelmingly, most businesses use a perpetual inventory system, and that is, as you remember, uh, a constant updating of the records, of the inventory records. Um, and that's typical because most stores are quite large and computerized. They use the barcode as uh, scanning inventory in. When we buy it and scan it out, it keeps an updated record of that. Uh, versus a much smaller type of business that what was more common when I was your age uh, because computer systems were not widely available and a lot of stores were smaller. Um, most of those folks depended on the periodic system, which literally means they're counting how much inventory that they actually have uh, in stock at the end of a period of time. So usually that's at least every month, certainly every quarter, and most definitely they have to do it every year. Um, and that's how they determine their cost of goods sold is physically counting those types of things on a periodic basis. But even if you're using a perpetual system, which most, like I said, most companies today do, that doesn't mean you never count it. You actually have to do a physical count, okay? Um, to make sure that the inventory records are accurate. And it's that physical count, particularly in a perpetual system, which helps businesses understand how much inventory they've lost due to waste or shoplifting or employee theft. Um, it's really that physical count that actually tells them more information because they already have a record of what's been sold. So clearly what's not there um, would tell different stories than that. But normally you take a physical count when your business is very, when business is either extremely slow uh, or your business is closed, so you can get a bunch of people in there to start counting stuff. Um, sometimes that's done overnight. Sometimes that's done over a period of time. But it's always done at the end of an accounting period because again, the purpose of a physical count uh, of your inventory is to really understand and make sure your records are accurate. Why are those important? Well, because you know from chapter five, only two things can happen with inventory once it's bought uh, by the store. It's either still with you at the end of the period, in which case it's your asset. If it's not with you, of course, as you know, they cost it out, so cost of goods sold. So that's important. Cost of goods sold is an expense account. And of course, you know how important it is that we get the income statement right. Right, all those adjustments that we did in chapter four should have convinced you that we take very seriously check and double check to, for the accuracy of those records, particularly when it comes to revenue and expenses. Ownership is important, right? Because even when you do a physical count, uh, you may not be counting other goods that you own that are not physically with you because they are being transported to you, they're in transit. And so you might've bought inventory that's still on a ship or a truck or a train and, and getting to you. Well, uh, if you bought that uh, FOB shipping point, you own it at the shipping point. So you actually have to 
make sure you're counting everything when you say you own inventory. Um, so that's that's uh, very important to sort of understand. And you kind of know that from our last chapter, uh, ownership transfers at FOB shipping point at the shipping point, right? As soon as the seller puts it on, uh, gives it to the carrier to be delivered, uh, the buyer owns it all this period of time before it gets to them. So it's literally inventory. It's an asset that they own, even though they can't physically count it because it's not technically in their particular possession yet still with a carrier, but it still matters. Uh, FOB destination, less of an issue, right? Because you're not actually counting ownership of the goods until they arrive at your destination, in which case you will have physical custody of those goods. And so they'll be part of the physical count, okay? One thing that's important for some businesses is they will hold some goods on consignment. Uh, consigned goods, basically, uh, you do not own. Other parties own those goods, but you allow them to be part of your store, either by renting the space to them, or you take a fee, a percentage of the sale every time it's sold. And this is true with, you know, car dealers, boat dealers, antique dealers. Uh, they sell a lot of goods on consignment. But it's also true of grocery stores as well. When you walk into a grocery store, that soda aisle normally is taken care of by an outside dealer. Coke or Pepsi will manage that aisle. So in other words, the supermarket, even though they have it in their store, uh, it's consigned that they don't own those things. Same thing when you go down the chip aisle or when you go down the bread aisle, um, oftentimes those are consigned goods. Do we have a question? Is that why you see those brand, um, different brand vehicles come in? in yes. Stock stores? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So, um, so that's basically uh, learning objective one, learning about uh, inventory in terms of rules of ownership. And that's important. So here you have a company that does its inventory count. They do a physical inventory count and they count $200,000 of inventory uh, during that time. However, there's certain information that we need to look at to see if it affects that or not. The first thing is they have counted certain goods that are held on consignment for $15,000. So that, if it's held in consignment, they don't own it. So they're gonna to have to subtract that 15,000 out of this 200,000 because they do not own those goods even though they counted them physically, right? They don't own them. Uh, the second thing is the company purchased goods of $10,000 that are in transit. They took ownership at the shipping point which means they own the goods even though they're not physically in the store, so they're not part of that physical count. So they have to add that 10,000 into their inventory. The third piece of information tells us that the company did not include inventory that had been sold, uh, and that was in transit FOB shipping. Well, of course, if it's been sold FOB shipping, you do not own it as soon as it gets to the ship, shipping company. And since it's in transit, the shipping company has it, you don't own it, you don't count it. So what would be the correct way to solve this? The correct way to solve it is to take out the $15,000 of goods that are on consignment, why? Because you don't own them, and add the $10,000 of goods that you bought but are not there, why? Because you own them. <laughs> and uh, item three was treated perfectly fine. So inventory really for this company is $195,000 of inventory. That would be the proper value of the inventory for that company. And that's learning objective one in a nutshell. So we'll take a quick break for questions here. So continuing on with learning objective two, this is going to be where you're gonna be introduced to the costs, inventory cost flow methods that businesses can use to determine their cost of goods sold. So remember how everything starts. Inventory is an asset. It's recorded on the books at whatever it costs. And we learned that clearly in chapter five. But once we sold it, 
once we've sold it, it becomes an expense, right? It becomes cost of goods sold. So the question becomes for businesses in accounting, how do we determine the cost of goods sold? And so accounting gives businesses a few different options. They can use any one of these cost flow methods. One that we're not gonna talk about, but is a real cost flow method is called specific identification. Um, it's very unique uh, way of costing out your inventory. Uh, it's not common, so we're not gonna be looking at it. We are gonna look at the three most common cost flow assumptions. The most popular, almost about half of the companies use the first method called first in, first out, what we call FIFO. And here, it simply is the first inventory that you purchased in the store is the first inventory you sold to the customer. So it's the first one that's used for cost of goods sold. And you'll see that in a moment. <clears throat> a solid second place is something called LIFO, last in, first out, which means the last inventory you bought into the store is the first one you sold to the customer. Um, that's another one. And then of course, the very last one here is the average cost. So this is how much money I spent on the inventory. The average cost of the item was X. So every one I sell, cost of goods sold is X. So you're gonna see how these play out in detail. Um, why would uh, someone use the LIFO? Yeah, um, well, we'll get to that. We're gonna to get to that. Again, it's, it's a choice and I'll, I will definitely answer your question after we explain these things. So again, clearly the winner here, um, FIFO is the most common, almost about half of the companies out there use FIFO. Uh, again, about a quarter, one out of every four companies use about LIFO and there's reasons for that that I will explain in a moment. Um, and then uh, the rest of them are sort of split, but average cost is in there as well. So you're gonna look at this. Nothing, none of this is gonna make sense without looking at an inventory list, okay? So in order to understand a cost flow assumption, you have to be looking at an inventory list, okay? Otherwise, again, this is not gonna be clear. So this company, Houston Electronics, has a product called a Astro Condenser. I'm sure there's a little bit of play on words there. If you're a baseball fan, you get it. Um, but nonetheless, the, the product itself is an Astro Condenser. The company is used electronics. They had beginning inventory. Remember how everything starts in inventory. What do we have at the beginning of the period? So we have beginning inventory. We have 100 of these units already in, in stock. We paid that, we paid $10 each for them. This cost is the cost of the business. Remember, we have to buy the inventory first before we can resell it, that's our cost. So we start with $1,000 of inventory already. 100 units at $10 a unit is $1,000. That's our beginning inventory. So if you're looking at learning objective five, remember everything starts with beginning inventory. So we had a hundred units in our beginning inventory or a thousand dollars of beginning inventory. Then we have a bunch of purchases, right? As you know, from chapter five, businesses are always buying inventory. This is specific to Astro condensers. And you see here on the 15th of April, uh, they went ahead and bought 200 more of these units. But look what happened their cost to buy them you those units increased to $11 each. And so they had to fork out $2,200 to buy that inventory. So that's the cost of that inventory in April. In August, they bought 300 more of these Astro condensers. And again, the cost increased to them, $12 per Astro condenser, $3,600 total for the August purchase. And in November, they bought 400 more of these, I guess they make great stocking stuffers in Texas, um, at 13 bucks a piece. Again, the price increased again to the retailer, the cost increased. So they ended up spending $5,200 on inventory. Look what happened, they bought 900 items, right? 900 more units. They start with 100 units, they bought 900 more. They have a total of a thousand units available for sale. On the cost side, 
they started with beginning inventory of $1,000. They bought $11,000 worth of inventory. That's the purchases. They have a total amount of inventory of these astro condensers of 12,000. So remember this from chapter five. This is very important to sort of put these in, the, in that order. Good news, only two things can happen to your inventory once you buy them. At the end of the period, you still own it, which is your ending inventory. And if it's not there, we, we just assume it's been sold, right? Uh, and so here, what we're, what we're told is that 450 of these units are still in the store. They're still our asset. The other 550 have been sold, okay? So this is where these cost flow assumptions happen. This is where they're applied. Okay, which units were sold? Right. Of these 550 that have been sold, which units were sold? That's what the cost flow assumptions help us answer. Okay, so let's take a look at that. With FIFO, the first ones on the list are the first ones we assume we sold. Okay, now this isn't an exact science. Don't think of it as, well, but that didn't really happen. It's, it's not important. What's important is there's a method to help us cost these things out. So this is an assumption? This is an assumption, right. These are all ways in which, you know, it's almost impossible to track each individual, that specific identification. For a retailer like Walmart, it's impossible to do that. Okay, so don't ask Walmart to go ahead and, and employ specific identification that this, you know, bottle of aspirin cost them $1.25, but this other one right next to it cost them $1.35. Don't ask them to do that. No one's going to, they sell too many to do it. It's just not worth their time uh, to cost that out that accurately, uh, that exactly. So FIFO, for example, allows them just to cost it out based on that list that we were showing. So again, the costs of the earlier goods on the list are the ones that we assume are sold first. That's the first out part. So let's go back to our list. Again, if you don't have a list in front of you, none of this is gonna make sense. Which ones are the first ones on the list? Well, the first items on the list are from January 1st beginning inventory. All right. So under FIFO, the first ones in are the first ones sold, or the first ones sold. So these 100, we sold 550, remember. So these 100 units have been sold as part of the 550. These 200 units now become first in. So these 200 units are also sold as part of the 550. So we have 300 units accounted for of the 550. We need 250 of those units to complete the 550 that have been sold, okay? So those are the ones that have been sold. What's left? Well, there's 50 left from August and there's 400 left from November. Well, that's correct because our ending inventory is 450. The book tells you First of all, figure out what's left in the store. What is your ending inventory? So of these, <clears throat> the first ones in are the first ones out, so they've been sold. So what's left in inventory? Well, the 400 from the November purchase is still in the store and the 50 more from the August purchase is still in the store. Look at the computation here in step one. Those 400 are worth $5,200 because they're $13 each. The 50 that are left over from August were bought at $12 each. So they're worth $600. So you have $5,800 of inventory in the store. Well, if you started with $12,000 of this inventory in the store and you have $5,800 of it left, you sold the rest. So the difference is your cost of goods sold. But again, you can actually verify that $6,200 is correct. 
How? Well, by looking at the sold, the ones that you actually sold. You sold these hundred at ten dollars each, which is a thousand. You sold these two hundred at eleven dollars each, which is twenty two hundred. And you sold two hundred and fifty of these at twelve dollars each, which is three thousand. Three thousand plus twenty two hundred plus one thousand is sixty two hundred. So you can verify both numbers. And remember, when we're looking at inventory, uh, you're only gonna be asked to calculate two things because there's only two things to calculate, right? You're gonna either gonna be asked, what is the ending inventory worth, which is this amount, or you're gonna be asked, what's the cost of goods sold, which is this amount. Using the FIFO method, that's how these are calculated. Okay, so FIFO basically looks at the inventory from, right, the first ones in the store, this is the beginning inventory all the way down through most of the ones from August, they're out, they've been sold. Cost of goods sold is an expense. This is gonna be on our income statement as an expense. The remaining units are still in the store. They're an asset, they're inventory. They're going to be on our balance sheet. Okay. So if we use the FIFO methods, the first ones in are the first ones we allocate to cost of goods sold. That's the first out method. LIFO is looking at that list in reverse. The last ones in that list are assumed to be the first ones we sold. Okay. So when we'll let's go to back to our list, here's our list again. Which are the last ones in of this list? Well, the November purchase is the last ones in, right? So under LIFO, if we sold 550 units, right? The last ones in are the first ones we've sold. So all of these 400 units are part of that sale of 550 and half of the 350 right because you need 150 more to reach 550 so that means you have 450 units still in inventory that are the remaining ones from august all the ones from april and all the ones in january are assumed to still be in the store so again, step one is they ask you what's in the store. Well, if you know what's been sold, again, last in, first out, these are the ones that have been sold, then clearly the ones on the top are still in the store. So of the 450 that are still in the store, you have these 100 from the beginning, the 200 from April, so that's 300, you need 150 more there from August. So you have $5,000 worth of goods in inventory. You started with $12,000 of goods in inventory. You still have 5,000 of that. The rest have been sold. Your cost of goods sold is 7,000. How do we know that 7,000 is accurate? Well, we can calculate the cost of goods sold as well by knowing that we sold all 400 of the November purchase which gives us the $5,200 of cost there. And we sold half of the August purchase, which gives us half of that, which is 18. 1,800 and 5,200 is 7,000. So you can determine it, okay? So that is how life, the LIFO method would work. You still are looking at the inventory list, but now the ones that are listed last are assumed to be first out. This is also the illustration here. Uh, again, the last ones in, in this case, all of the, uh, all, all of the November uh, goods and half of the August goods have been sold. So they're gonna be part of our cost of goods sold. Remember, that's an expense account. That's gonna be on our income statement. All the other items are still with us. They're our asset their inventory. Okay. 
The last method is probably the easiest one because it's simply a weighted average of everything. So what does that mean? Well, you have to look at two things when you look at our inventory list. One is how much money did we spend on inventory? So we spent $12,000 on these Astro condensers and that gave us 1,000. So we bought 1,000 Astro condensers for $12,000. So the average cost is the average cost of each astro condenser is simply 12 bucks each. Okay. So you have 450 left in inventory, simply multiply it by the 12 bucks each because that's your average cost. So you have $5,400 of inventory left over. If you started with 12,000, and you still have 5,400, you clearly sold the rest, 6,600 is sold. How do you verify that? Well, you sold 550 times $12 each, okay? So that's how you would verify it. This is simply putting all of them in the big tank to get the average cost per unit. And then if you, of course, you know you have 450 units left, so you can simply multiply that by the average cost the rest is cost of goods sold. Again, you can do it as the book does it, which is the total available minus your ending inventory, gives you your cost of goods sold, or you can calculate it in another way. Both ways are correct. Which one should they use? So this is where I'm gonna to get to the question uh, that Greg answered earlier, uh, asked earlier. So here's use electronics, and again, under uh, the rules of GAAP, they have choices. They can use any of those methods to calculate uh, cost of goods sold in inventory. Which one should they use? Well, for Houston Electronics, um, their gross profit is largest under FIFO. The gross profit is smallest under LIFO, and it's in between for average cost. And their net income is largest under FIFO, uh, smallest under LIFO, and sort of a between by average cost. So the best thing for Houston Electronics to do is to use the LIFO method, because as you know from chapter five, that gross profit margin, right, that gross profit rate and the net profit margin are really important profitability ratios that investors and analysts look at. And so FIFO would give them the largest gross profit margin and the largest net profit uh, as well. So that would be the case. So why would, uh, of course they have options. Who would use a LIFO? Well, that's a good question. Can you think of a, uh, a business, a retail business, where, where something first comes out, when a product first comes out, it's very, very expensive. But then over time, maybe over many months and certainly over uh, a year or two, those prices start coming down. Well, if you're thinking electronics, you're thinking correct, right? Because the prices of new tech, whether it's a new cell phone, the newest um, game system, the newest television, um, they tend to be at a very, very high price, both for the customer walking in the store and for the business that has to buy it. However, over time, those prices tend to go down, both to the business itself who buys the inventory and to the customer. And so for a company like that, the last ones they bought are probably the cheapest, which means that the LIFO system is probably gonna work better for them in terms of giving them a better, a bigger gross profit margin and a bigger profit margin for net income to sales than the other methods. And so they would be free to use LIFO, right? Uh, again, these are, methods of helping us cost out the inventory and businesses are free to use or any and all of them okay any of them that works for them so again to answer the question on lifo that would be one of the businesses that would be doing that 
um, for a maker of large products like beer or soda, um, you're probably, you're not going to go ahead and, and figure out specifically the batches of, of barley or hops uh, or sugar or other types of things that came in at different purchasing times. Um, you're probably just going to average them all together. And so you may have some businesses that say average cost is basically the way to go. But it's clearly a choice on how they want to do it. Free choice in this case. Okay. But either way, it has to be consistent. Uh, that's what this means here. This little part is whatever inventory cost flow method a business uses, they have to use it consistently. Um, they can, on occasion, decide to change their cost flow methods. In this case, this is an example of Quaker Oats uh, deciding that they are going to adopt the LIFO cost flow assumption. Okay. Um, uh, and so they can, they can do that, but the change is going to affect their financial statements. And so they have to really kind of think twice on that. And they have to be as consistent as possible. You can't just decide to change every year. Oh, I'm gonna do life. This is a LIFO year, next year is a FIFO year. No, can't work that way. Okay, you gotta have real uh, reasons for changing. Okay, so let's practice this uh, together and you're gonna have lots of nice homework to do. Um, <clears throat> this is the accounting records of uh, Shumway Agri uh, AG is it the agricultural uh, implement. And they show the following data. They have beginning inventory. Remember, everything starts with beginning inventory. So this company has 4,000 units at a cost of $3 per unit. Clearly they, like all companies go and buy more. So they bought 6,000 more units, but the price increased to four. Uh, sales is what they've sold of that. So we don't necessarily need to look at that. We can say, okay, beginning inventory plus purchases will give us the total amount for sales. So 4,000 was the beginning inventory and we bought 6,000 units more. So we have 10,000 units available for sale. Clearly we sold 7,000 of those 10,000. So that's what the sales number represents. Remember, uh, only two things can happen to inventory. It's either still with you or you sold it. In this case, they've given you the sales. We don't care about, we're not calculating revenue. So we don't care. They could have sold it for $100. It doesn't matter. All we care about is the costs here. Okay. So here uh, they're asking us to determine the cost of goods sold, right? So of the 7,000 units that they sold, uh, what are the cost of goods sold for those units? Well, again, it depends on the method we use. Let's assume that they use FIFO. FIFO means first ones in are the first ones we sold, first ones out. So in this case, the 4,000 units are the first ones in, they are part of the 7,000 that we sold. Right. So 4,000 of the 7,000 have been accounted for. We clearly need 3,000 more units. That came from the purchases. So what's the total cost of goods sold? 4,000 units times three bucks plus, uh, plus 3,000 units at four bucks. And so basically the total uh, cost of goods sold for fi using the FIFO method in this case is $24,000, okay? That's the FIFO method. What's, and that's cost of goods sold, right? What's the other thing they can ask you about? What's the inventory? Well, what's left in inventory? If you started with 10,000 units and you sold 7,000 units, you have 3,000 units left. Which 3,000 units do you have left? Well, all 3,000 units are from these purchases. Those are inventory. So again, only two things can happen and that's the only questions you're gonna be asked. So you have to read the question carefully. Are they asking you to tell them what the cost of goods sold is? Or are they asking you to tell, tell them what the value of the inventory is? Because those are the only two things you can tell. 
Okay, so please be sure you're reading it properly. The next way is to look at this and say, okay, what if they use the LIFO method? Which 7,000 units were sold? Because we're asked again for the cost of goods sold. Remember LIFO, the last ones in are the first ones sold. So the last ones are in other purchases. So these 6,000 have been sold as part of that $7,000 sale. And we need one more thousand from this. So all 6,000 units at $4 have been sold and 1,000 of these units at $3 have been sold. So you multiply that out. This is incorrect. The math on this is incorrect. It's 24,000 plus the 3,000 total cost of goods sold using LIFO, 27,000. What's left in inventory? 3,000 units at three is left in inventory. Again, they want you to you know, tell them the cost of goods sold in this case, but you can do both. You can do both. Last is the average cost. Again, you need totals. You spent a total of $36,000 to buy 10,000 units of whatever product this is. All right. So based on average cost, you're gonna look at the name of the company and say, there's gonna be some way to figure this out. 36,000, thank you. $36,000 divided by 10,000 units will give you $3.60 per unit. And then this is what your book shows, right? Total available for sale minus your ending inventory. There shouldn't be a dollar sign, there's another mistake. Um, but you can also just say 7,000 units times 360. And you should be getting $25,200. Okay. Regardless which method you use, there's always some way to figure it out. Do you have some questions? Wasn't that something? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I'll stop.